Okay, so you're ready for the trip around the world. Uh, I'm Steve Goldstein, and uh, I was from the NSF networking division. Uh, Steve Wolf brought me on board, and uh, I hope he hasn't lived to regret that. He's just about to sit down. I, he's smiling. Okay, we're okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I want to come across to you with a, with a, with a confessional, uh, a story that um, I don't know that I really admitted to anybody else, certainly not publicly, but now the statute of limitations, uh, as somebody said yesterday, has passed, uh, is uh, expired, and uh, I don't have to work for a living anymore, so I can be just very honest because uh, my job is not at risk. Um, when Steve invited me to join NSF, I had been working as a, a support contractor to NASA, who was uh, setting up the NASA Science Internet, their IP network. And uh, Steve wanted some cost studies uh, done for the prospective T1 NSF net. And apparently a couple of people had given him uh, point estimates. And so he asked Tony Villasenor at NASA, whom I was supporting, if, if he could provide any help in coming up with something a little bit better than a point estimate. And uh, I was working at MITRE Corporation, which was doing a lot of support for the Defense Communications Agency. And we had a, a group there that was uh, pretty good at doing costing. And so we did a one month study and I gave Steve some results that were a little bit more than a point estimate. It said for various kinds of combinations, this is what the cost would be. Steve liked it and invited me to uh, join NSF uh, at some point, and I was more than delighted to do so. Well, uh, Steve and I have something very much in common, or at least I'll speak for myself, but I don't think he'll uh, deny this. Uh, we very much like to be uh, left alone to do our own work. We're on a Myers-Briggs scale. I think we're both very much introverted. Um, introverted meaning we charge our batteries by being alone with our own thoughts, whereas some people like Dan Van Bellingham in our group uh, are extroverted. They charge their batteries by being with groups of people. So um, Steve was going to these meetings of this, this frick that you heard about yesterday, this Federal Research Internet Coordinating Committee, you know, the, whose mo uh, motto was, if you don't like it, frick it. And uh, th this, these were the, uh, the people from the various uh, group, uh, agencies like Energy, uh, uh, DARPA, NASA, and so forth that uh, we're running research uh, networks, and the idea was to, to do coordination. And so Steve asked me to come to a, a meeting or so, and then he said, gee, why don't you go to the meetings now? And um, I said, okay, I'll go to the meetings. And uh, so I show up at the meetings, and they say, where's Steve? Meaning Steve Wolf. And uh, I said, well, he's got other stuff to do. Well, we need Steve at the meetings. I said, hey, look, uh, if you want to really get some stuff done, you're going to have to learn to deal with me. Well, this is the wrong thing to say to a bunch of bureaucrats, you know, but I, I was just doing this in my typically humble, low-key, and self-effacing way, and, uh, but it didn't work. So they didn't want to talk to me anymore. They didn't want to deal with me. And I went back uh, to Steve, and he said, look, I can't make them like you. So there I was, a uh, new hire, not much uh, to do then because these other people didn't want to deal with me. And Steve said, gee, you know, we've got these grants that are expiring, one that uh, is connecting uh, Neudernet to JVNC, John von Neumann uh, Computer Center, and another one to Larry Landweber, who is doing some TPC, uh, TP4 to, uh, uh, was it uh, FTP um, gateway conversion with somebody in France. And both of these uh, grants are about to expire, and we, somehow we've got to keep them renewed because now the community is, is counting on this connectivity. So see what you can do about getting them renewed. So we kind of had to beg Larry to, to ask for an extension to his award. His work was done, but we had to extend this award so that we could uh, keep the communications links open with France because now a lot of astronomers were depending on it to get up to the Simbad astronomical database in Strasbourg and so forth. So um, I started doing that, and when I learned what red tape there was in, in, involved in doing these things, I could see, gee, the rest of my career at NSF is going to be spent chasing down awards, and that's no fun. So um, I proposed, and Steve went along with it, uh, to, to start this International Connections Manager solicitation. And um, 
this was to, have, to, to make one award to a group, uh, to some entity, which would coordinate international awards so we could just buy a service. You heard that yesterday. We just buy a service from them to connect to another country, uh, to, get, to connect to several other countries. And uh, so we did that, and actually uh, the award went to Sprint, who had not much experience at all in the Internet field. And uh, one of the things was we were asking initially for two 64 kilobit circuits, one to France and one to the Nordic countries. And let me see, my computer is being updated. I, well, okay, so I'll keep talking while they, well, uh, well, okay, okay. Restart later, great, well. Okay. Being a Mac person, I'm clicking on the thing, but, what? Oh boy, here we go again. Oh, the left button? Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Uh, so, oh boy. So anyway, um, we made the award to Sprint. Sprint actually zero bid. They said, we'll do it for free. So I mean, that, that's a good way to win a, an award, I guess. And um, we started, a, and we learned, by the way, or at least I learned, from the uh, the way that the partnership had been set up with Merit and IBM and the state of Michigan, that it was a partnership. So we went to Sprint and we said, this is not going to be your typical government contracting thing where, you're, where the government and the contractor are adversaries. This is a partnership. And they didn't believe us at first because they just weren't used to that. But the partnership did evolve and they just did some wonderful things for us that most government contractors never would have done because it was a partnership, you know, so we learned. But the International Connections Program really was, to my way of thinking, it was a stepchild of the NSFNet program. Uh, it was sort of off to the side. The successes we had really, and Larry Landweber picked up on this yesterday when he whispered this to me, the exact words I was going to say to you, what successes we had were because we were flying under the radar. It, it was a low-key thing, there wasn't that much money in it. As long as we didn't make any trouble, as long as we didn't make any waves, nobody bothered us. And, so, and what I had to do was try and um, leverage money here and there because we, we hardly had any money. For example, there was no travel money for me. But then Mel Cement came up to me and said, you know, you do more traveling than anybody else in the whole directorate. Well, that's because I was invited to conferences, and I'd say, gee, we don't have any money for travel. Oh, we'll pay your travel. And so, you know, I traveled all over the world, business class. And which just leads me to one more thing, and then I'll introduce my panel. Uh, if, if a stepchild is going to survive, the stepchild has to know how the family works, has to know the rules. Because if you're going to break the rules, you've got to know the rules. Otherwise, you're not very good at breaking the rules. And most of the time, I was treading very close to the edge, breaking, not quite breaking the rules, but nothing illegally, put it that way, but very, very close to the edge. And the guy that helped me that knew more rules than anybody else in the whole foundation is back there is Don Mitchell. Don, just stand up and wave. If Don hadn't been at my side helping me break the rules, I never could have gotten away with the stuff that I got away with. And if I were at NSF today, I couldn't do today what I was able to do then because after we broke the rules, they found the loopholes and they tightened them up. But anyway, that, that's sort of the past. Now, the, the ride that I had at NSF was the, the best, most productive time of my entire career. It, it was sometimes agonizing fighting the battles that I was fighting while I was there, but the results that came out of it were, were just, I never would have believed that I would have been in a position to be able to accomplish the things we did in terms of connecting so many countries of the world. So now you're going to hear about this. Well, I'm hitting the right button. Curse you, Bill Gates. Then, yeah, gosh. Now you press that one? No? Here we go again. No wonder people are having how many how many IT people does it take to run a laptop? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'll hit this. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to introduce our speakers um, in, in rough order. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. In rough order of, of connecting. And uh, 
our, our first um, thing had nothing really to do with the Internet Connections Manager program per se, <clears throat> because Canada was, was always uh, uh, one of our closest networking partners. And in fact, there was a, one of Larry Landweber's uh, early conferences where he got people together who were, who were doing research networking was in Sydney, Australia in 1989. And would you believe that there were 29 of us at that meeting? It grew into becoming the Internet Society later on that was drawing 1,500, 2,000 people to a meeting. But in 1989, there were 29 of us. And uh, John Curley from NRC, uh, uh, National Research of Canada, uh, was thinking they were just sponsoring the CANET, the Canadian Network. And he said to me, gee, we're going to have this thin 64 kilobit network um, along your northern border. That's going to be CANET. And, in case we, and we're going to connect to you in three places. And in case we break, can we heal our network through NSFNet, which at this point was T1? And I said, sure, John. You know, as long as we, if we break down, we can heal our network through you. And uh, so the deal was made. And I can't tell you how, how much now the U.S. networking benefits from that partnership with Canada, because now they get some of the biggest, meanest networking in the world and some of the, the best technical advances with Bill St. Arno, and they've just been very happy to share their resources with us. So it's been a partnership that's paid off beautifully, I think, for both sides, and Dave McNeil from Canada will talk about that. Good morning. Uh, I'm scared to death to touch the button. Which button will I touch? <laughs> this one here. Enter. Enter. There's, there's this right arrow. Isn't it? Oh, the right arrow. Okay. Uh, mm. No, that's me. Oh, no, that's not me either. Oh, I was going to give my talk. I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Give yours and then I'll... Okay. Um, I'll, I'll put that up there just for, for you to read while I talk. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. And more importantly, thank you to NSF and to you for all of the assistance and inspiration and openness and sharing that enabled us in Canada to get our networks up and running quickly, um, standing on your shoulders. Um, we are very appreciative of it. The value of these networks, as you all well know, is most in the rural places, and I come from a place in what I call the North Woods uh, in New Brunswick, and I played that card for many years in the development of networks that the value to us in the rural areas enabling our faculty to stay uh, in New Brunswick and en enabling our students uh, to get the best of education in remote places, uh, and I think that's still true. Um, especially as we go, at least in Canada, further north, but in other countries into less developed areas. In any case, to our history, uh, in 1984, we, we were running a network uh, affiliated with BitNet, and uh, that was run efficiently and effectively and was widely used. At the same time in Canada, we had, uh, out of the West Coast in British Columbia, uh, X25 based uh, X400 network called CDN net uh, as well uh, the defense research establishment was connected to this should say ARPANET I'm sorry um, and we had uh, nascent uh, OSI networks uh, growing up in the larger provinces but the most important part of this stage was that we learned about each other we learned to organize each other and we learned to build uh, networks and operate them. So the initial context that we're working in was the uh, very rapid growth of NSF uh, network and the uh, pervasive nature of IP. The operators of NetNorth, the management of NetNorth, came to the conclusion that the uh, RJE protocols were not going, going to be long for this world. and. Uh, had to come up with a way to cope with this. The way we came up, coped with it was to embrace it, embrace the change, uh, and 
a, a group of our best people got together in Winnipeg for two or three days and came up with a plan uh, which would transition us both politically, organizationally, and technically uh, to the new environment. At the same time, the regional networks were coming into operation and, of course, promptly growing south. And in an east-west country, that's uh, always a card you can play. Um, so the, the first gathering of what was called uh, CANET was in 1989. The University of Toronto did much of the heavy lifting in operating the network for the first while. Uh, Dennis Ferguson, uh, Bob Chambers, Warren Jackson. Initially, we had 56 KB links across the country, and we had three links into the United States, uh, one in Montreal, one in Vancouver, and a larger one in Toronto. And as Steve said, we uh, supplied mutual backup to each other, which was much to our advantage, I must say. Uh, and at that point, we also created a not-for-profit. Whoops, I'm going to get updated. Uh, I'm old enough to need it, but... Uh... This Bill Gates guy is really intrusive. You know? <laughs> He's yours. <laughs> get a Mac. Okay. The network we formed, CA Net, was of limited bandwidth, but we could afford it. Uh, at the same time, we managed, some of us in the universities and research labs, to convince our government that we needed a really advanced network if we wanted to have first-rate uh, institutions. Uh, so we got a small bag of money from the federal government. They created a economic development, basically, or at least in the beginning, organization Canary. Uh, and this was heady days, as you all know. As the network matured through the middle 90s, uh, we were upgraded eventually to 235 uh, megabits per second, uh, two, 345 megabits links into the United States. Uh, but we were also moving towards commercialization, following, again, your example. So while I have a few bruises, I don't have nearly as many bruises as, as some folks here. Um, the research and education establishment moved off to build us another series of networks, CANET 234. Uh, it now should be CANET 5, but the numbering is getting a little tired, so it's called CanaryNet, which makes things an awful lot simpler, actually. And CANET itself, um, it says CANET Inc., that's not true. The network ceased operation March 31st, uh, 97. But as my friend Jerry Miller said, basically we did three things right. We knew when to get in, we knew how to nurture it, and we knew when to get out. Oh, that one didn't work. Uh, when you get to look at them in the manual, this, in the uh, paper copy, this, this is an interesting slide. Uh, its point is there's six orders of magnitude in 10 years, uh, increase in speed. I won't spend any time on that. You can look at that for a minute. Other people have come up with very nearly the same uh, set of lessons. This is a, a little slide I grabbed from a 1990 presentation. And you can tell me what's different, except that OSI may have a silver stake through it, maybe. Uh, all this is written along with more, with the funny stories, as opposed to what I was talking about in a book called The Nation Goes Online, or A Nation Goes Online. It's free, and it's available from the site shown on the, the URLs here, uh, and several other sites. So if you get a chance to write down those URLs, I'll leave them up here as I walk away. And uh, if you don't, you can Google A Nation Goes Online. And uh, again, thank you very much, and particularly Stephen, thank you for your great assistance over the years. Thank you, David. I just want to, uh, I had neglected to show you a couple of slides here that would just kind of set the, <clears throat> the stage well. Uh, uh, with. Um, Sprint, uh, one of the things that the Sprint benefited from in terms of the partnership was they set up their own IP service as a commercial service because of the mutual learning involved. And the real hero initially was our principal investigator, Bob Collette. Bob uh, had a, a business meeting this morning and can't be with us right now. But then Bob uh, moved up in the company and Jeff Stubbs became our, uh, our rep at Sprint. And Jeff is here. And Jeff, do you just want to stand up and wave? Uh, Jeff and, and Bob and a couple of other Sprint people were really, real heroes. They, they really went above and beyond because they, they finally believed in this partnership thing. 
and they, they shaved prices, they did things that they didn't have to do, and I just don't have time to go into all the little things, but there were quite a few to really make this thing work. So this was basically the connections to both NSFNet and Sprint's cross-country network, uh, Sprint Link in 94. Just to give you an idea of the reach, the Latin American countries, by the way, were coming in on Pan Amsat, who cut us a wonderful deal. They came in to, uh, to Miami to, uh, was it Homestead Air Force? Uh, Homestead was Air Force Base, was it? Um, as a matter of fact, they came in somewhat later than we expected because a hurricane blew down the first antennas uh, at the base and they had to set up new ones. And then Sprint actually put a T1 link from Miami up to the uh, pop in Washington so that all this uh, would work. And that's how the Latin America, some of the Latin American countries first got connected. So this was basically what the network looked like around the end of the uh, project. And the thing I really want to stress is, for the most part, for the most part, not all of them, the quanta was 64 kilobit per second. So that's something to keep in mind. In the early days, we're talking about 64 kilobit per second, at least in the international links. Maybe some of them got 128 or 256, but most of them were 64 kilobits to begin with. By the mid-1990s, we're beginning to talk 45 megabits per second. And then, of course, now we're talking into multiple gigabits per second. So, so things did, did go along. I remember being in Poland when the, in uh, Krakow when the whole country was connected to the internet with 9.6 kilobits. And stupidly, I tried to read my, my mail on MH, and I gave the INT command, you know, bring your mail in. And then I said, oh my god, what did I do? Because I had probably a backlog of 200 mail messages, and I couldn't stop that command because of the, the time lag. So anyway, this was sort of the state way back then. You notice China was connected, Russia was connected, and uh, a lot of Latin America was connected. So at, by the end of the project in 1996, uh, with the exception of Canada, which you know, was connected on its own, these were countries that the ICM project helped to bring in. Okay, so we'll get through CNET and get to Peter Villamos. Now, Peter Villamos was the executive director of uh, Nordinet. Dave and Peter and I um, and Saul are all retired old guys. Uh, but uh, Peter was, um, Peter still remains active as a consultant to Nordinet. Dave still remains very active. Saul. Um, I got drafted by ICANN, so I guess we don't quite fade away that fast. But uh, Nordinet was always a wonderful, wonderful partner of ours. Um, in, in the initial stages, we could share some of the costs of the transatlantic links. As things went on, our budget just wouldn't permit the, the degree of sharing that we would have liked to uh, have contributed. And Peter would say, look, it's all right, once we have um, NSF participation, that's basically all I need to go to my Nordic Council and get the money for the link. So the, uh, the NSF participation, these things meant a lot to them. And um, I always had a very warm spot in my networking heart for dealing with Nordernet. And uh, one thing I kind of remember was at a meeting once in, uh, in Helsinki, Finland, they were up on the board drawing network diagrams and they were talking about you know, the network's here, and they would talk about us, and then they'd point down and they'd say Europe. And uh, basically, to my way of thinking at those times, they really got it up there, and they kind of led Europe in, in a lot of the networking developments there. So, Peter, would you like to come up, please? Thank you, Steve. This one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to be sure, I'll begin by showing you what we are talking about. This is the northwestern corner of Europe. It's quite a large area. And Nordonet is a collaboration, an international network that interconnects the national networks in these countries. Um, the whole thing started already in uh, 1985. In fact, earlier as discussions. And these discussions between uh, the countries, our interested networking people in the countries, led to a proposal which was approved by the Nordic Council of Ministers to uh, set up a Nordic OSI-based network that should interconnect the Nordic national networks which were being built 
in order to make one common platform for all Nordic researchers and connect them to the rest of the world. That was a, a very fine idea. And we got started and uh, worked for two years with very little results. We got extremely frustrated and decided that we had to do something if you wanted to make a network. And uh, we were in a context in Europe at that time where OSI was it. It wasn't a law we should make OSI, but any initiative which was not OSI could not expect funding. And uh, there were strong activities in the rest of Europe for OSI. So we were in problems with our funding. But then we decided we, we have to do something until OSI comes. So we included interim protocols, waiting for OSI to be complete. And uh, what we had already working were, of course, TCPIP in the universities, DECnet, in fact, over distance, uh, BitNet Earn, and uh, some X25. So we decided to provide all these protocols and interconnect the uh, countries with these protocols. So we had uh, uh, the OSI protocols in, waiting for them to complete. And I think and for another five years, this, uh, ah, here we are. Restart later, and where do, what, where do I press now? Left, thank you. So in, um, in 87, we decided we had to do something here and now. And what we did was very much based on uh, collaboration the Nordic researchers had with Larry Landweber's CSNet, that's my name of it, and the meetings he organized, of which we had several in the Nordic area. So. In order to uh, get this network to work, we wanted it to be connected to the world, and that was the rest of Europe down at CERN, and of course to the NSFnet in the USA. So at a meeting already in the spring of 1998, uh, Larry Landweber helped us convince Steve Wolf, I don't know who convinced whom, but we were happy in getting approved to connect to NSFnet at the Don von Neumann uh, Supercomputer Center, at 56 kilobit over satellite from Stockholm. And that uh, connection, in fact, was uh, materially ready in the summer of 88, but it wasn't functioning with TCP IP until the end of 88, which was a luck for us because we just avoided the Morris Worm in that way. So, and in fact, this setting up of the connection to NSFnet happened at the same time as the whole network, the Nordic network was set up. So it started out interconnecting the Nordic countries, connected to NSFnet from the beginning, and also connected to the rest of Europe via, via CERN. So that was a very big step for us. And of course, having this connection, having got this connection to, uh, to NSFnet, contributed very much to the growth of the network. But uh, just to describe the environment we worked in, I would like to quote a sentence that Steve sent us when we wrote the history of Nordonet two years ago to, say, to give the scene. And that was, in fact, in these years, in the beginning of the uh, end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, the rest of Europe was mired in omphalosceptic network protocol politics. I didn't know what this word means, so, so I can remind myself by this footnote, which is mine. Uh, over the OSI suite, there was a very strong movement in Europe and the large countries in Europe who were nearer to the center, that they had not do anything but what was, what you, comme il faut, you had to do what they said. In the Nordic, we were more uh, farther away and uh, the young people, they cared for networking and not for politics. And so they made a functioning network during these days. But we were not well regarded by the rest of Europe during the, that time. On the other hand, we got a big advance over those because we got started so early. Um, another, if another good result of this collaboration with NSFnet, good result for us, but for the world as well and for Europe, was that uh, already in around 1991, we set up an unofficial root server in in Stockholm because we could not live with that. Our whole network in five countries went down when we had no access to a root server. And this unofficial root server was uh, proved to be stable enough to be approved to a real root server, which is the I root server. And uh, this is also an early result. And that was the first and only root server outside USA, 
at that time. Now it exists in hundreds of copies around the world in the new root server system. Okay, fine. The traffic, of course, grew as it did everywhere. And just to show, this is a logarithmic scale of bandwidth, and the years are shown below. And uh, you can see how we came around up to 2 megabit in 93, and in fact, 4 megabit in 94, when it, FNet was still intact. But uh, that, was, uh, that was a very difficult time for us in terms of congestion on the link, and uh, we needed more. So we, had a, we succeeded really by the first, of course, the contribution by NSFNet and Steve Goldstein, who approved that we should go that way, and by the fantastic work by Sprint to get an, in, a transatlantic uh, 45 megabit connection set up from, uh, from USA. In fact, it ended in, in England, in Stockholm. And then f f from the um, European part of the carrier, which was Tele2 in Sweden, who which uh, received 34 megabit of those because we had the technical problem of converting 45 megabit from America to 34 megabit in Nordonet, which was ingeniously made by a, root a router, which was a first at that time. And the rest of the capacity was then channeled off to Janet in the UK. But this uh, 34 megabit really was a big success. It was implemented in, I think, six months. And uh, really what went on inside Sprint to achieve that is undescribable. They, they did a fantastic work. And it just came into operation before the IETF conference in the summer of 1995, uh, which happened in, uh, in Stockholm. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'll end here because I'm only talking about the history. And I would also like to take the opportunity to, to really thank for these very many years of constructive collaboration between Nordonet and NSF. It was undescribable how easy it was to get approved connectivity. Of course, it cost money for us, but this was really fantastic. And we felt so uh, euphoric because, because of this tight collaboration with NSF and NSFnet, we were the best network in Europe for many, many years. Thank you. Um. Um, thank you very much, Peter. By the way, um, <clears throat> Sprint uh, uh, got the line uh, from their long lines uh, division, and the uh, president of Sprint International pretty much had to promise his firstborn to uh, get that line. He had to give a 15-year commitment to get that 45 megabit line across the Atlantic. This was the first international private line of that magnitude <clears throat> that had ever been uh, uh, leased. And I understand Bob Collette told me that when he got to the IETF meeting in Stockholm and they opened the line, by the way, it was very, very congested, and then they opened the line, and all of a sudden, like overnight, it was up to 60% utilization. That's how much traffic was backed up. But he said five people came to him at that meeting and then wanted, the 40, wanted their own 45 megabit line because they showed that it could be done. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, changing pace a little bit, looking down south, I had, I had mentioned the the problems with connecting Latin American countries that were not, and I think to this day still are not well connected to each other uh, directly, although that's improved quite a bit. So a lot of the connectivity was, was by their mutually coming in by satellite to Miami. Now Saul Han came to uh, the Organization of American States at about the time this was all beginning to happen. And Saul is a mathematician from uh, UNAM in Mexico and he came to the science and technology division. I think he thought that he was going to be dealing with scientific you know, research matters in, in, in whatever the mathematicians would do at OAS. And we quickly um, uh, disabused him of that thought and uh, stuck him into the, uh, into the networking discipline. But uh, I've got to say that the collaboration we had was, was just beautiful because we could work hand in glove. NSF couldn't spend money on the networking uh, in the other countries, but Saul could with his OAS budget. We, on the other hand, could spend some money connecting them to the NSF net through the Sprint. So th for many, many years, we really worked hand in glove. Saul would go down to the countries and actually deal with ministries. Uh, there are people whose lives were actually threatened because they were the ones that were getting the, the connection, and other ministries and other people said, Gee, we want it. And Saul went and did all that mediation, being able to 
speaking his native tongue in Spanish and know, knowing the people coming from OAS. He was able to do all that, putting money on the ground for antennas and things and, and routers and so forth. Um, he helped in that way, and then we worked with Sprint to, to get the things in. So it was really a hand-in-glove operation, and I'll invite Saul to tell you about that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, uh, for this kind of introduction. I'm very pleased to, to be here to talk to you about the early developments of, uh, of the Internet in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, actually, before I, I started working there, there were a few connections that uh, uh, were already in place. I think the, the first country to connect to the Internet in, uh, in Latin America was Mexico. That was mainly through the uh, uh, tremendous effort uh, and enthusiasm of the astronomy people at the National University UNAM, who through the uh, Mexican satellite Morelos made a first connection to NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in, in Colorado, with the help of the uh, National Science Foundation. And then uh, Brazil, um, Argentina, Chile, uh, yesterday, I, we were reminding with uh, Glenn Reichardt where they came uh, also by satellite uh, to uh, uh, College Park. And, uh, you know, uh, having these international connections was a, a, a big thing for the countries, not only in terms of uh, prestige, but in many cases it was like a thing of uh, having some power. So we were reminding uh, about the southern country where there were two very large institutions almost uh, across the street where they uh, both wanted to uh, uh, get connected to the, to the U.S. And talking about policies, uh, one of my first tasks was to talk to the people at NSF and convince them that uh, in this case it was really necessary to have two separate connections into the uh, into the U.S. because otherwise these institutions would never agree on having uh, and, and sharing their, their connection. So actually, uh, uh, Steve said, yes, let's go ahead with it. And these two institutions got connected. And for a number of years, they, they maintained their separate links to the same spot in the U.S., interchanging packets in the U.S. and then back to the, uh, to the countries. Anyway, so these are just some of the... Uh, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> we got our super technician. <laughs> yes, yes, from Korea. Yeah, that, that's a great advantage here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as Steve mentioned, in 1991, we uh, established really a very uh, close partnership between the uh, National Science Foundation and uh, the Organization of American States, where I was uh, directing a project to. Uh, help countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to interconnect uh, to the NSF net. And through the process, we uh, worked uh, uh, with some really great people in Latin America, real true pioneers like Guido Teramon in, in Costa Rica, who eventually became Minister of Science and Technology, uh, people like Jose Soriano in Peru, uh, 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 Florencio Utreras in Chile, Ida Holtz in Uruguay, many people uh, uh, who's, who work 24 by 7, you know, really working and trying to put these things together. So let me uh, uh, talk about some of the initial barriers for uh, uh, internet connectivity in, in, in Latin America. Uh, one is the, uh, the lack of um, infrastructure. Most of the uh, connections, not all, but most of them, had to be uh, uh, done via satellite. And uh, uh, if you wanted uh, some interconnectivity, let's say between Uruguay and Argentina, uh, each country had to set up their own satellite connection to the U.S. and from the U.S. back to the uh, interchange and to, to, to the countries. Um, this, in, in turn, was a very expensive thing because satellite bandwidth was very expensive and usually universities uh, didn't have enough budget for this. Um, 
uh, we also helped out uh, training people, uh, workshops, seminars. Actually, a key meeting was set up in, back in 1991, uh, jointly by the Brazilian government, by the OAS, with the help of the National Science Foundation. NSF paid for the uh, uh, travel of the uh, uh, U.S. participants, and OAS with Brazil paid for the, uh, for the Latin Americans. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the theme in this uh, meeting is, is the word partnership. I, I believe that partnership was really the key to set up these uh, early connections uh, in Latin America and, uh, and the, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, we help with uh, equipment, uh, uh, training, uh, sending consultants, NSF facilitated the, and I'll talk about that more, facilitated connectivity in the, uh, in the U.S. Um, several partners really played a role in this. Uh, a number of, uh, of countries actually connected using the PanamSat satellite, uh, which had its uh, air station in, in, in Homestead. So Steve came up with the idea of setting up a point of presence in Homestead to facilitate connectivity from Latin America to, the, uh, uh, to this point of presence. And then Sprint would make the connection to the rest of the, uh, of the uh, internet. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, we set up from the very beginning in these uh, collaboration efforts with the countries was to make the, 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 the projects self-sufficient. And that means that uh, for us to find the partners or the right partners, we had to identify uh, institutions that uh, would pay for the recurrent prices of telecommunications. Once we found an institution who was willing to make those arrangements, either by paying directly or making uh, uh, specific uh, contracts with the telcos, then we would pay, if necessary, for stations, routers, training, etc. But for us to identify the, uh, the original partners, it was a matter of making those projects self-sufficient. And I think that was a, a very good decision in, in the long term. So, uh, uh, my, my time is almost up. So, the, this slide just shows you a number of uh, internet connections that came uh, through this process. I mentioned PanamSat to the NSF node in, uh, in Homestead. And there are a bunch of other uh, uh, satellite connections that are not shown here that use the, the, the uh, uh, Intelsat satellites or they used uh, the Morello satellite. Now, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, let me just then make a, uh, a, uh, a summary. Um, I would say that NSFNet really played an essential role for the development of the internet in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, before NSF, there were just a few bitnet nodes in Latin America and a number of UUCP connections using, you know, uh, dial-up or uh, other means of connectivity. Um, the developments in Latin America were actually similar to the ones in the U.S., but a few years delayed. And, uh, uh, like the uh, Internet 2 project in the United States, one thing that made a huge difference, but this is, of course, much more recent history, is the fact that um, big telecommunications company developed optical fiber around the, uh, the whole continent in the Americas, and that led to uh, new, really interesting uh, the recent developments like the Clara project that interconnects many of the countries using uh, high bandwidth, which is very similar to what happened in China and what happened in India, that because of this uh, optical infrastructure placed by some of these companies, some of them are already defunct, but the, object, the, 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 the cable is in place, they have taken really great advantage of it. So I think this is a, a very short summary. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you so much, Saul. You know, there are so many stories to tell that we could probably keep you here for hours if, if uh, you wanted. And we're going to actually have debrief for the oral history thing uh, this afternoon for about two hours. I, I want to now introduce uh, Jan Grunterod from uh, the Czech Republic. And uh, when I first uh, met him and we started working with him, it was then Czechoslovakia. It was one country. I'll just tell one little tale that um, I think it was 1993, um, Ira Fuchs wanted to send over a tape that they could use on uh, their uh, mainframe there for sending BitNet over TCP. And he just didn't want to mail it because, you know, things were kind of dicey back in, in, in those days. And I was going over to, to Italy and then Poland, and so he said, well, gee, could you somehow get this tape to Jan. So I arrived on a train at 6 in the morning from Poland in the main train station uh, in Prague. And Jan met me at the train station. And so I had this, you know, in a plain brown wrapper, give him the tape. And I'm doing it. I'm saying, oh, my God. You know, if the Russians were here and if this were the good old days and I give this guy this tape at 6 in the morning in the train station, we'd both be arrested. <laughs> But anyway, the Czech Republic now has just got fantastic internal networking, and Jan will tell you the story. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank for inviting to this very exciting event, and I would try to use my time to explain to you what happened in our region. So before the political changings, there were no computer networking on international level. And I happened to work in the area of computer networking for quite some time since graduated at the Czech Technical University in 75. In that time, we have a British computer ICL 472 with quite advanced uh, national network. But then about in 1985, it was time to replace it. I remember meeting at the Ministry of Education, and they told us, well, now you have three options what to choose. Well, option one is the Russian EC1045 mainframe. Option two is Russian EC1045 mainframe, and option three is Russian EC1045 mainframe. So we, let's say, bought to these mainframe, installed it in our computer room, but in the future, after the political changes, we were much more careful what technology we are going to use because we appreciated the freedom what we have having. So here is the... Here is the short story about the uh, evolution. Actually, the first uh, uh, service came by least line of the 9.6 kilobit per second from Prague to Linz in Austria for business service. As Steve mentioned, by the time all Czechoslovakia was connected with the line of the speed, so you can imagine the level of services. We were very proud that we can upgrade by obtaining a faster modem that the link could be two times, 9.6, one channel used for the bitnet traffic and another for the experiment with the internet. And in January 92, we, let's say, switch all two channels, match them together, and we have uh, uh, well, we were very primed to have to 9.2 kilobit per second for the internet service. And in February 1992, we organized official opening of the internet services in Czech and Slovak Federal Republic with the National Science Foundation representative attended. I will talk about that uh, later on. But it uh, now looks simple, but I will tell you one more story because as I mentioned, there was no international networking, and of course, after political changes, there was influence from the rest of Europe to, that we joined X25. But, and even that we have an offer or proposal of donation to, of two X25 switches from one big European country, and they wanted us to pay just the transportation cost. 
because we didn't want it that, so we turned, sorry, we have no resources to money for transportation. So one day we were surprised, they brought it to the car at the premises of university. So we couldn't ref refuse such a donation. We brought it to the university, but I must tell you, we never switched that off on because we were thinking it's the not right technology we should use because we have re really, after uh, having all analyzed, uh, uh, to go the TCPIP way, and we have bought the, uh, let's say, Cisco router for the core our network so we could really join the evolution of the IP world without uh, not losing time with X25 exercise. And uh, maybe just very briefly, uh, what we receive information uh, from the, let's say, NSF and the Internet community was very important. And uh, th there are just the few, let's say, aspects that uh, influence the evolution. One I would like to make, the RIPE, it was a very important body that was dealing with the IP addresses assignment from the point of scene in the region, it was quite very important role of the Austria government who decided to support the evolution of internet in the central and eastern Europe uh, regions. So because of time is uh, running up, I will, let's say, skip out of that. Just I would like to mention it was a very wise decision of the Internet Society to organize IDENT conference in 19... 94, when it attracted global attendance and it has significant impact on the evolution of the internet in our, let's say, regions. And very important in CUP was the regulation of telecom services because in the monopoly situation, it was very difficult to deal with that. Well, here is the map, maybe difficult to read, but I would like to show that here is the let's say, Vienna of the center of the networking with the services to Czech Republic, Poland, Slovakia, Romania, and Croatia. By that time, yeah, uh, only, let's say, speed of 64 and 124 uh, kilobit per second, but by that time, it was quite an achievement. I skip that. This is the latest evolution and uh, try to <coughs> reach the concluding uh, remark. Uh, this is the founding document of Czech Technical University in Prague, uh, where all the activities started. It, it was founded in 1707, being the oldest technical university in Europe. So uh, it, was, it is now a variable item in the archive of Czech Technical University. And this is the invitation of official opening of the internet services in Czech and Slovak Federal Republic in February 92. The left part of the invitation is in Czech, but right part is uh, English, so you can read that the uh, keynote speaker was uh, Steve Goldstein from National Foundation giving the talk internet yesterday, today, and to tomorrow and it was really, we appreciated that Steve managed to come to the event and open the services of the internet in Czech and Slovak Federal Republic. And I was just recently approached with the current president of the Czech Technical University who asked me to put original of the document to the archive of the university because he thinks in about a hundred years or so this document may be variable for the let's say, future generations. So just to conclude, I would like to thank NSF for the support during the pioneer period in the, in the out region, and especially to Steve and Steve Wolf for their uh, remarkable best contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, the last speaker from the international partnerships is uh, Kilnam Chon from Korea. Now, Professor Chon has been a, a leader in networking throughout the Asia-Pacific region for many, many years. So I, I don't think of him here as just a representative of Korea, but of the whole Asia-Pacific area. 
And in fact, in, uh, I think it was 1996, a number of us were at a meeting in Scuba in Japan, and uh, Professor Chan was one of the organizers of the Asia Pacific Advanced Networking Cooperative. So he's going to talk to us about uh, some of the Asia Pacific developments uh, connecting to the U.S. Professor Chan. Yeah, first, thank you for inviting me to the, this memorable uh, event. In the last 20 years on the Internet, including the NSFNet, there are so many things happen, and many of them are unthinkable. I'll give you one example. Can you think about back in 20 years ago, like a small country in Asia called Korea to become the uh, largest uh, broadband access in the world 20 years later? Do you know that's what, the, what that, does it mean? Means the uh, Korea today has as much internet traffic as the USA. That's what happened. And uh, this is not just a Korean phenomenon. It's all those uh, Northeast Asian countries, like uh, China, Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong. It's all over. And uh, let me give you some uh, uh, what will happen in the last 20 years uh, in this area. <laughs> Okay, uh, first, uh, early 1980s, uh, internet started in Asia. And uh, typically, we use a UUCP. And in some countries, like uh, Korea and Australia, uh, we use a TCP IP. In the case of Korea, we start a TCP IP networking 1982 May. And uh, USA, on the other hand, you start uh, ARPANET with NCP about 20 years earlier, and the transit to the uh, TCPIP January 1st, 1983. So the, we, uh, I guess, did, we did a pretty good job. And, uh, but we couldn't have the IP, direct IP connection to the USA, because the US, those are regulation uh, prevent, except to the NATO countries. And uh, Steve Wolf solved this problem, opened up the IP connection to the uh, uh, the rest of the world in around 1986. And uh, mid-1980s, uh, NSF uh, contribution to us is a CSNet and the academic net workshop. Uh, sometimes we call it the uh, Lally Land Waivers Workshop. And uh, this one to us is a community uh, building. Before this, we didn't really have those network community in Asia or globally. And uh, Professor Landweber really pushed to build up those international community. Oh, here comes. And uh, then uh, uh, you start the NSFNet. And the uh, implication of this NSF, NSFNet to us is the uh, IP connection, not a dial up. And uh, uh, which is uh, uh, great, like uh, it's sort of beginning of a global uh, internet. Then uh, late 1980s, NSF initiated the, the international connection uh, uh, program. In the case of the Asia Pacific, we pick up a hub in uh, Hawaii. I mean, you, you look at the Pacific, uh, it's a fairly obvious place and easier for the uh, uh, USA. So the, we, the Asian countries, country in Asia and the Pacific, connect to the Hawaii, and the Hawaii is a part of the USA, so you have a uh, NSFNet. And that's how, what we started. And uh, it, was, it was great, uh, not just for the linking, also we built up those community, and which is still lasting. Like a uh, next meeting of Asia Pacific networking will be in Honolulu in uh, January. So the, you are welcome to come to the Hawaii <laughs> in a January, especially from people like from Michigan. <laughs> okay, 1990s, uh, gigabit networking, what we call the broadband uh, research and education network. And uh, around the 1996, we sort of start at the same time. In the Asia Pacific, we call the APAN, as Steve uh, Goldstein mentioned, and he helped help us to build up this consortium. In Europe, they call it the giant. 
and in the United States, you call the uh, internet and Abilene. Somehow, this whole thing started at the, at the same time, 1996. And uh, again, NSF made a, a project to connect the USA to the Asia Pacific, and uh, this with a gigabit networking this time. And this time, hub is in Tokyo rather than Hawaii, because it's, uh, it seems to more, uh, make, make more sense, especially financially. Oh, no. No, and uh, okay, you missed one. Okay, uh, before I go this one, uh, in uh, year 2000, uh, we have a project called the Gloriard, and uh, <clears throat> this is the first global uh, consortium, USA, and uh, Korea, China, Russia, and uh, Netherlands, and, uh, and uh, Canada, and uh, no unit later. But for us, this is the first time we really had uh, those Eurasian uh, community, including uh, Russia, China, and uh, uh, Korea. And uh, it's a very, it was a very difficult uh, uh, project because uh, this community building in a global network is awfully difficult. Especially, we didn't have any those uh, uh, much exchange with Russia. So Russia, China, Korea, we start uh, working on, on this one. And uh, the role of NSF, NSF on this one, what does USA do with the Eurasian networking? I guess NSF, NSF is a glue. If we didn't have an NSF, probably this project didn't go through. So the, you are helping even as a glue. And uh, of course, at the same time in uh, Europe, and uh, Asia, we have uh, those uh, called the TAIN project, uh, Trans-Eurasia -Euro project, building up uh, those uh, connections between Europe and uh, 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 Asia Pacific. And uh, together, I guess we are building up a pretty good uh, global those network community. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chan. Okay, so we've been talking about all countries from all over connecting to the NSFNet structure and later on to, and in general to the U.S. academic networking structure. Now, there was somebody, there are people inside the NSFNet structure that had to deal with all this thing, and so Elise Garrick is going to be reporting on that. Now, uh, is, is Milo Medin in the audience today? Oh, yeah, Milo. Uh, uh, you know, there was this book written, Everything I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And I would say that the most important things or everything that was really important for me that I ever had to learn about networking when I was working from NASA, Milo taught me. Uh, so thank you, Milo. But, you know, when I, was, when I was out at NASA and Milo was there, Milo would walk into the office where they had a bullpen with all his networking uh, people, and he'd say, who are we? And they'd answer, us! And he'd say, and who are they? And they'd answer, them. And it was a very strong us and them. And I, I tell you, sometimes when I, when I mentioned that we, we felt like, you know, stepchildren there of the NSFNet program, sometimes I felt like the them. But Elise was there inside the merit structure, uh, helping everything to work and helping everything to work smoothly. So she's going to tell us how it sort of felt like from the inside. Thanks for the introduction, Steve. Actually, I never felt the us and them piece. I always thought it was very inclusive. So uh, hopefully, uh... <laughs> so my job is to kind of summarize how this all came together. We've heard from the various networks that came through the ICM program. And then the NSF net, which was kind of the glue or um, the inclusive part of it, I felt, that pulled a lot of all these programs and projects together and we had the flexibility and the ability to do that because of the openness that NSF gave us. So this is just a summary of the first year of what the international connections were that were on the backbone. And like we're having a celebration today and as Jan mentioned the celebrations that the Czech Network had, um, ONET had a celebration to celebrate their connection between um, Toronto and Cornell. And Hans Werner Braun, who was my boss at the time, was invited to open that celebration. 
Fortunately for me, Hans Werner didn't like to travel too much. You might have noticed we had a videotape of him yesterday. <laughs> so I got to go to um, the University of Toronto to help open the network. And I got there, and Dennis Ferguson, who was uh, in charge of bringing up this big celebration, had done a whole lot of preparation. And part of that was that they had some real-time traffic flows, and they were going to put that up on a big screen, much like this one. And so up, we turned the switch on, now the traffic's going between Canada and the U.S. They were really worried about doing that, so they'd captured the traffic flows the day before, and they had them in reserve, just in case. But everything worked smoothly, except for one little glitch. They also wanted Hans Werner to be part of this presentation. So they had arranged for him to have a chat session online on this big screen. And we all thought that we'd prepped Hans Werner well. Yesterday, he had been prepped quite well. And uh, so they brought the big screen up, and I typed, Hans Werner, we're live. And Hans Werner typed, where's Elise? And so <laughs> this is the big opening ceremony for that. And I sort of felt like I was Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and I, the Wicked Witch was looking for me. But it, it caused quite an interesting stir at the opening of the ONET in Canada. By the end of the year, we had the Nordic countries online also. And, uh, I guess when I said we were inclusive, there were exceptions on occasion because we did have a lot of interconnections with our federal government networks. So one day at NSFNet, I got a call, and it was Milo Medine. We have a lot of Milo stories. And Milo said, who is this? And I said, this is Elise Garrick. And we didn't know each other at the time. And he said, well, where's Hans Ferner? And I said, well, he's not here right now. Can I help you? He said, they're hacking into my network. Make them stop. <laughs> I said, who's hacking into your network? He said, somebody over there. You know, they're coming through your network. And I said, OK, well, what's your name again? And I'll see if you're legitimate. So I called Steve Wolf, <laughs> and I said, do you know somebody by the name of Milo Medine? And should I pay attention to him? Steve said, yeah, you should pay attention to Milo. <laughs> so then I called Sergio Hecker at JVNCNet, and I said, OK, we have this network that's coming in through JV and CNET. It's coming from Finland, and they're hacking into NASA. And Sergio said, OK, I'll take care of this. So then um, the next thing I know, we didn't see any traffic from the Nordic countries. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Sergio said he tried to call everybody at the Nordic countries, but they were sleeping. And so he just decided to shut down the link. So the next morning, I guess there was a very surprised young man in Finland because a bunch of people walked up behind him at his workstation. And he was not allowed to use the net for quite a while. And the link came back up, and Nordjanet and the Nordic countries again had connectivity. But it was a very interesting time. So that's kind of the first year. After that, we had tremendous growth on the NSF net, and we were inclusive, and more and more countries and nations joined, joined the, um, the collaboration and the communication and the community that was the network. And I don't need to read all these, except to tell you that by the end of the NSF net in 1995, when we turned it down, 44% of the routes on the routing table then were non-US nets. So as you can see, we had grown significantly, and it had made an impact on all of us and expanded our reach far beyond the local shores of the US and North America. And this is an eye chart, which I suspect that none of you can read. So the URL is the more important part. But these are statistics that have, um, from September in this year, 2007. And basically, what it tells you is the number of users. So the top bar up there is Asia. And they have 459 million users on the internet. The next long bar is Europe, then North America, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Australia, Oceania. And as you can see, and I put the URL, you can all go out and check this and see whether you agree or disagree, whether we can trust this information from the web. But the networking, the network and NSFNet and my collaborators up here on the podium have made a huge difference in bringing all of us together and opening opportunities and doors for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elise, and thanks to all the panelists. Um, 
I just want to follow up on what Elise said about this hacking. It seemed that in the very early days, as soon as a network from another country would connect to the U.S., uh, the, uh, the kids there, I guess they were college uh, students at that point, had, a, had approved their capabilities by hacking into something in the U.S. government. And so we almost expected it after a while. But in those early days, the one from Finland, um, actually Larry Landweber got, in, got involved with that because he called Juha Heinonen over in Finland, and they, that helped to, to track things down. And another story I seem to remember along those lines is I think when Poland connected, somebody hacked into NASA and uh, they hacked into the NASA shuttle. And uh, they, they tried to, I think, do something to that schedule. But what they didn't realize that the shuttle that they were hacking into was not the space shuttle. It was a little bus that ran from NASA headquarters out to Goddard Space Flight Center. <laughs> so, so with that, um, I don't know, what's, what's our ending time? Are we well past our ending time? We're zero, so I'm sorry we can't have you ask questions as I had hoped we could. But thank you for your attendance. Stuff. Yeah. So thank you very much. It's been a wonderful panel. We are behind schedule, which means that what you need to do is get your stuff for, at the break, come right back in. We're going to try to get back on schedule by sacrificing this break. <laughs>